the most important thing I've learned for myself I can do is always work on my mind, always be better in my mind. And, you know, like, and I want to go back to Seneca. I think he said, like, you know, you're really living philosophy when you become a friend to yourself. Yes. What yes. is a friend to yourself? Yeah. That's in your mind. I got to tell you something, and I've been wanting, I've sent you a couple of emails once in a while, once in a blue moon, you know, because I see, I follow you online. And I got to tell you, amongst our crew, our old crew to the uh-huh. new crew, you know, you're the only one who stands up for shit. Oh, thank you. Really, you are the only one. Everyone, when shit is happening in the world, posts like really nice quotes and, you know, nice photos. You're the only fucking one who actually said, I want to say this on the podcast because you have no idea. How, I mean, I've sent you a couple of emails about yeah. it. Yeah, right? I'm just. Oh, that's so nice. Dude, it's your, your being an example of what you believe. You well, know? thank you. I, I, and, I, I try. And, and you succeed, man. It's really impressive. I just want to let you know that. I, you know, this is before the podcast. This is something right. I wanted to share. That it's it's wow, really so nice. been amazing to see. I'll take the compliment. Wow. Here, do you have QuickTime? Are you on a Mac? I do. Will you will you just uh, start a QuickTime backup? Just because since we're not on ZenCaster, sometimes uh, Zoom can drop. Yeah, a yeah, bit. that's a great idea. So it's one to- one sided, right? Then you're like editor. Yeah, then they concept. can just put the audio together at at the very least. Just make sure if you if you pull up QuickTime, just make sure it's drawn from a good mic or whatever. Um. Now, do I do a new audio recording or new movie yeah. recording? Yeah, just do new audio recording. Okay. Hello. Can you? We, yeah. Okay. Great. great time's working. Yep. Um, I don't need to save it now, right? I no, no. To... You'll save it when you stop. Hello. 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 Okay. I'm, it's... Yeah. I can keep the vol- volume uh, out, but I can just see my the thing, the volume bar yes. going when I talk. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so then when you um, when you hit stop, it'll ask you to save it. Okay. All right, sweet man. Okay. Well, I feel like this is this is a weird way to begin, but. I feel like you almost died since the last time we talked. I did, pretty horribly. <laughs> what happened? Dude, I went in for elective surgery, and it was a big mess up, and they rewrote an artery and didn't do it correctly, and I was, you know, discharged, like, I was coming out of it, and, um, and, and uh, they make, you know, when they make you walk afterwards to, to um, make sure you're fine, so it can release you, sure. the artery burst. And it was a abdominal artery and it burst with such force that all this blood pulled up in my abdomen and burst out. I was spraying blood everywhere and basically, you know, kind of like put it out, you know? Wow. And how, how, yeah. like, how, how fast was this? Like you were just, you felt you like, you felt like, uh, you were alive and then your body was just like quitting like in a matter of seconds? No, it was like when I was walking, I felt like someone all of a sudden hit me with a sledgehammer in my groin, wow. in my lower abdomen yeah. area. And I just didn't even know pain like that was possible, especially when you're not expecting it. Sure. And then it just started ballooning. And I remember looking in shock, just like, what the hell? And then, And as I got back to the bed, and then it's all of a sudden there was like a sound, like a hose bush bursting that I'm spraying blood everywhere. And next thing I know, I'm like just like covered in soaked in my own blood and like, I wow. uh, wouldn't recommend this experience to anyone. It was awful. It was the most, I mean, I can't even describe the pain and also, but talk about <laughs> mortality, right? Like, yeah. like, cause like I was actually rereading, um, I love Seneca and Aurelius, right? Talk about facing your death. And it's not how I expected to do it, you know? And I actually remember they, the thing that served, saved me was the fact that I hadn't left the hospital yet. Sure. Um, every resident there told me like, look, if you had just walked out, this happened, it probably wouldn't have, you would have died right away. And so they grabbed me, wheeled me in the OR, slashed me open, which wasn't fun either. And, and, um, and saved my life. I had to go in and, you know, clamp that artery and then, sure. you know, fix things. But um, I remember that feeling of when I'm in the, the room in the OR, I'm wide awake and I'm just spraying blood everywhere. And there's like a, this poor resident, you know, these res- he's got his hands on me and he's like blood is spraying through his hands and I'm looking around. And at this point, you're in such shock. I think you're not, no longer in pain. Just looking around, it was almost like a circus of people running around, screaming, things clattering. And I remember thinking, 
And I remember starting to feel things in myself shut down. Like things like, because I guess later on, I looked at, you know, like the blood gets shuttled from organs or everything, sure. the brain, you know, body's like losing blood really fast. I remember thinking, I am a good man. I don't deserve to go like this. Right. And, you know, like this is not how I deserve to go. And then I thought, oh, shit, I have no choice. Right. And I had to give into that. And in that moment, I remember having to give into that. I had no fucking choice. Yeah. You know? it, aside from like, well, if you think about it, I think we don't do a good job thinking about our mortality at all. But when we do, we think like, oh, what if I find out I have cancer, right? Or you, you, you kind of see it as this slow thing that you're having to grapple with or wrestle with, right? But yours, what's surreal and strange about yours is it was this sort of gruesome, sudden emergency thing, but it also wasn't like you got hit by a bus or you you got shot in a war zone. It, it, it was just like a, a chance error and then a freak set of circumstances. Flash forward to you're literally watching your life shoot out of your body. Uh, that must have been incredibly strange. Dude, it's like, you know, the thing is, the funny thing is you stop thinking. All you're doing is, it's like, at that point, it's just flashes of pictures and, yeah. and fierce emotions. And I remember feeling at one point fear, like, I didn't know fear was a thing like that. Like, like, like because it's like, I think the hind brain kicks in, right? The primal yeah. brain kicks in. And it's just, it's just emotions and images. And then once in a while, we're thinking, oh, I, I don't want this. This is not how what I, I wanted it. I don't want this. And then like, I don't have a choice. And in that moment, like you can either fight it or like, I didn't even think I could fight it because I had no choice. And I was like, okay, you, I, I remember surrendering to it and lying back. And that's when I finally closed my eyes when I surrendered to it. And I kind of like fell into this dark, dark blackness. And I remember that this this very clearly, and who knows if they were pumping me drugs at that time or not, who where this came from, but it's literally like falling into a dark ocean. Like, you know, like you see a diver fall, like a free driver falling in the ocean, sure. falling on my back and the ocean is dark and the only light is emanating from me and just falling, falling deeper, deeper, and then nothing. How long are we talking about? From the moment you stand up till the moment like, okay, to be we've stopped the to bleeding. Be I don't know, because I think I was, to stop the bleeding, they had to go in. And yeah. I think I was out, I had passed out by then. Or so, I don't know, it feels like hours, it was probably like minute, two minutes, I don't know. Right, right. You know? <laughs> well, is, isn't that interesting that like how time, I think in these moments of crisis, time, the pandemic was a moment of crisis that illustrated in a different way, where suddenly you realize what a construct time is and how how strange our relationship with it is where, you know, a, the pandemic three years feels like three months, but then in this moment where you're dying, you know, three minutes feels like three hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's also very clear. The images are very clear in my head. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The, 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 that's a great observation, man. That's a great yeah. observation. So, so, so they stop the bleeding and then you come out of it at some point, yeah. not dead. W what is that like? Yeah, I was, in the, and yeah, I was under surgery for like six hours. I woke up and I mean, I was very drugged up. Yeah. You know? And then it was like, okay, I survived. Now what? And actually the worst part came after it was like, because of what they had to do to, to you know, go in, caused a lot of damage. And I basically lost like two years of my life and just, severe yeah. severe pain just getting through the days and then i have finally had another surgery last year that's fine and this wonderful doctor from the tough steps all down the country they got together and they finally fixed everything mm. and but it was just like man talk about like living day to day moment to moment when you're in fierce pain that's all you do is just live day to day moment to moment well, so it was actually harder coming out of it the, the living part was harder after a while for the two, next two years I well, imagine me very destabilizing. Did you did you have any anger though? It feels like there there'd be a way that one could come out of this. And obviously, it was an accident, but it it wasn't it wasn't like a tumor that almost killed you. It was a mistake yeah. or a series of mistakes that were made by people and an institution. How, how do you there? I, I imagine there's this tension between like 
I'm so glad that I'm alive and I almost died. How could you do this to me? Yeah, actually, I wasn't angry at the beginning. I was grateful because I saved my life. But mm. later on, some stuff came out that, oh, my God, this was a complete confederacy of dunces. <laughs> and it says, you realize this is what a shit show some of the medical system can be. It was yeah. a complete, like, oh, my God, if I had known an inkling of what I know going in, I never would have gone in. Right. right. And that's when the anger came. Sure. And, you know, but anger, you take action. You know, so I took action and, um, and that's, that's the thing. Yeah. Anger came once I learned, but sure. before it was like, I felt like I'd survive. And then it, I was just in survival mode. Sure. And I was literally just trying to do what I write about. So like the, my main thing was I can't let my mind get destroyed by this. Right. I cannot let the pain, the emotions destroy my mind because my mind goes everything else, you know, like if, if I become a shit show there, everything else is worthless. Well, I imagine that was a, a big test for you in a way. I, obviously you're an active. Oh my person. God. Yeah. <laughs> you do lot, you do lots of stuff that just, just to not be mobile and, and the, 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 the curve of getting back to your old self must've been really hard, but as someone who is so big on self care and mental health and all of these things, I have to imagine that changed your practice in a lot of ways or challenged the practice for you because you know it's easy to look in the mirror and and do not easy but it's yeah. easier to look in the mirror and do some of the stuff that you've talked about in your books it's it's harder to do that or sorry it's easier to do that when your everything else is working it's harder yeah, to yeah, do yeah. that when you feel like crap right like because oh my god especially yeah there were days where honestly i didn't you know i was miserable you yeah, know, there were days I was just like, fuck it, I don't let myself stay in the misery. But then it was like, I know where this will lead. You know, it's like if you just, it's just that's the pattern you're creating in your mind. And at that time, my body was so screwed. The only thing I could do was work on my mind. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll tell you something, it, it's incredibly hard. I mean, in fact, there were, there were times where I just gave up on it and then I came back to it. And, um, but, but I worked this time. I mean, it's, it's funny, like how in like moments of stress is when we work hardest, sure. right? So I work hardest on my mind when I could. And when I came out of it, when I got my health back, it's like my personality was different. It's like mm. my inner being is different because it was over time, just obsessively survival mode, get up day by day, just work through it, get power sure. by hour to get through the damn day. And then when I got my health back, which was just about a year ago, um, it's like my everything, my happiness, everything, the my set point is like in a way I never had before. It's huh. really this. It's really interesting. Now, I didn't need this experience. This yeah. experience <laughs> didn't make me better in any way. Yeah. It's like what I chose to do with it made me better. If that makes sense. Yeah, because because like when I read, uh, and I obviously I know you, but when I when I read "Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends on It," I I see it. It's like this is Kamal at at, at the bottom of this pit, and he's clawing his way back to mm -hmm. what he's capable of being, what he wants to be, how he wants his life to go. And so you do that. That's your journey, and and I know all the other stuff you've done. I imagine part of what must have been frustrating, hard, but then also familiar about where you were when you woke up out of this is you're you're basically back in that pit but it's a oh. it's it's a more severe pit and then in some ways not that the other one was your fault but it's like it it, it was something that was done to you that just happened do you know what i mean like you're you're back to where you were before having told yourself i've already gotten out of there you're like you wouldn't yeah, have expected yeah, yeah. to find yeah. yourself back there uh, that uh, it must have been familiar in the sense that you're like, oh, I know this place, and scary probably in the sense that you're like, I, I could, I could not get out of this again. Yeah, it would, and you know what's really hard sometimes to deal with is because you think to yourself, I don't deserve this. Yeah, that I don't deserve this. Why did this have to happen to me? Sure. And that's like that's like good old Seneca. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dealing with Nero throughout his life, right? Yeah. And, and I kind of thought about that and laughed a bit. And actually, which is why I don't think I'll ever write about this experience. Or maybe I will. I'm just I trying think to write Kamal, fall, uh, Kamal falls down, Kamal gets up, writes a book. Kamal <laughs> falls down, Kamal gets up, writes a book. Sure. That's <laughs> the good that comes book. out of it. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it I, was that. No, go ahead. 
no yeah i mean when you read seneca like uh you have it's you I, I think of seneca's life so seneca is this successful young lawyer and then he gets tuberculosis he has to spend basically eight years or 10 years in egypt convalescing he comes back he rebuilds his career then he runs afoul of the emperor and he gets exiled on these trumped up charges and like the week before he goes to exile, he loses his his infant child. You're, you're, you read some of these essays and you're like, this isn't a guy talking about these things in ab the abstract. This is a guy who's had his fucking guts ripped out and, yeah. you know, is is on the verge of despair, is looking at the loss of everything he ever worked for for a second time. Like life, life can do that to you. Yeah, and that diversion, it's, like, it's, it's that not deserving it thing that yeah. really messes you up. Yeah. I think that messed me up more than anything. Yeah, I can imagine. And I had to get over that. Because you don't that. deserve it. You're one of the nicest people I've ever met. <laughs> Is that, you know what I mean? It's not like, it's not like you're like this scumbag or it's not like you were doing something you knew you shouldn't be doing and then it didn't work out for you, right? It, it, it's it's not like you got canceled and you're like, hey, the punishment is more than the crime or something like that, right? This is like a freak series of incidences. And again, yeah, you're walking down the hall of a hospital and and then you look down and your blood's all over the floor, right? Like this is a, yeah. that, that must've yeah. been a, you definitely don't deserve it. And then there's also the, the, it can't happen to me -ness, which is similar to the I don't deserve it, right? Like yeah. th things like this don't happen to people like me. Yeah, or just, yeah, could, you don't sit around imagining that. Like even if you sit around and imagining worst case scenario, that's not one that would come up in your mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I'm not that creative. Well, I yeah. just... I just interviewed Amy Morin, who wrote, uh, you know, the that viral list of 13 things oh, Amy's mentally great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, Amy's great. She, she lost, she was telling me she lost her before she wrote that list. So again, the idea that great, insightful work can come out of tragedy and pain. She loses her mother at 23. And then on the third year anniversary to the day, her 26 year old husband dropped dead of a heart attack. So it's it's not only I don't deserve this, but like this doesn't happen. This isn't how things are supposed to go. This is a violation mm. of every actuary table, yeah. every statistic, yeah. every probability. Like healthy people don't go into the hospital for minor procedures and come out worse. That's not how it goes. Yeah. But the yeah. truth is that is how it sometimes goes. One out of a it thousand really times, but it happens. Yeah. It really is. It really is. And, but you know, it's all theory until it happens to you. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> until then, it's just theory. Well, we accept, yeah. we accept the freak good luck of our lives with no yeah. question, right? Like the fact that you and I are born, the fact that you and I have experienced the things that we've experienced, all the lucky breaks we accept as our just desserts, as totally rational, reasonable, regular things, even though the vast majority of the people on the globe have experienced no such luck, right? Uh, and then something bad happens and we go, why am I so cursed? How could this happen to me? I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm in fear of it, but my life has been fairly blessed. And so I often am hot, you know, the, the mathematical concept of the regression towards the mean, I, mm. that, that hangs <laughs> over me like the sword of Damocles. <laughs> That's funny. You know, with all these things, the only thing in the end, when it comes down to my unit, the only thing that matters is who am I going to be through this? Sure. That's all that matters. And you kind of, you get to that point and that's a choice you have to make and no one can make it for me. Sometimes it's a hospital bed choice. You know, I made some very clear decisions in a hospital bed that I'm living. Sure. That I, I am living and my life is much better for it now, but like, you one of this, but the very, in the end, it comes down to who am I going to be through this, and that is a choice. It is, and it is a choice when you're going through something hard. Eventually, everyone has to make it. There's many. There's two paths, basically. Yeah. If I was to be very black and white about it, there's two paths. Am I going to be better through it? I'm going to uh, as the best I can through it, or am I just going to let it be, let it be bigger than me, it, it, know, uh... let it destroy me? At the, the early days of the pandemic, you know, I had two young kids under four. I was staring out at this 
empty, unopenable bookstore that I'd sunk my life savings uh-huh. into. And I wrote a little note to myself. It's, I think it's back there somewhere, but I basically just wrote, you know, uh, 2020 is a choice. Will it make you a better person or a worse person? And I, that, that's kind of how I try to think about things. It's like, it, it, it's not, am I going to be, it, 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 at the core, you don't decide whether this moves the ball forward or back, whether you make money or not, whether you survive or not. All of that, the Stokes would say is, you know, things maybe you can influence a little bit, but you don't control, but you decide whether it makes you a better person or not, right? Like, cause that, that's, that's something on the inside that you know, theoretically nothing on the outside can touch unless you, unless you open up the city walls and you let the enemy in. Yeah. And you know, no matter your resources in life, if you're in a hospital bed wearing that, that stupid hospital gown with all those needles in you and yeah. people coming in and out, you've lost all your sense of dignity and just poking and prodding you and, you know, like every 20 minutes and goes on for days and days. It's like, you can really, it's a, it's a, it's any, I, that's an interesting thing. That's a great equalizer, no matter what sure. your resources sure. in life, you end up there. It's no different than anybody else. You've got no resources in the sense that you're still on the hospital bed in that misery. And it's like, how am I, what am I going to do? How, who am I going to be? You can have loved ones around you, you know, saying all the right things, but it's still you in that hospital bed going through that pain. Sure. You know? And, and the, it's, this, it's a very human thing. It's a the, very, very human experience. This was in the depths of COVID, right? Or was this right before? Um, this was a few months before COVID. Okay. And then last year when I had the surgeries to fix everything, there were complications because of the previous thing. So I ended up back yeah. in the hospital been injected with every pain med they had. Sure. And again, the surgeon telling me I could die because of all the stuff before. And, but this time I didn't die right away. This one, it was more like you could die. Right. Uh, that was during COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll tell you something very interesting. Uh, I told them to stop telling me that. I oh. said, look, you can't put that in my mind. I love, I think you're awesome. You're looking sure. out for me. He was trying to get me to do another surgery. And I was like, look, I'm done with surgery. You can't guarantee me that this won't happen again to me. I am so done. You have no idea. I said, there's a closed window. They wouldn't open the windows because of COVID in the hospital. It was the weirdest thing. I was trying to explain <laughs> to them, fresh air help. It would help. They didn't yeah. Get it. Yeah, they didn't get it. It was really calm. The hospital is the worst place to be sick. Yes. You know, and I was like, look, I'd rather jump out that window <laughs> than have another surgery. You see, I'm sure. to stop saying that I will die without surgery and just do your best to treat me where I am. And what I did was I just sat there the entire time through the pain and I would just imagine myself on a beach doing my gymnastic rings, feeling healthy, feeling powerful, feeling like completely cured. Everything was great. And you know what? No surgery. I think four or five months later, I was doing my gymnastic rings on a beach, watching the sunset, just enjoying it, feeling great. And then I remembered, oh my God, this is all I was living in the hospital. This is the exact image I was living in the hospital I'm doing now. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. That moment was incredible. Ah, oh, I bet. How, so I... There was something else I, I I wrote down I wanted to ask you about like mm-hmm. in, in some in some sense you're very likely and then in the other you you strike me as the most unlikely but like I don't think you were an army ranger weren't you I wasn't a ranger I was infantry I I, I just I've never heard that part of your story I don't think you don't talk about it very much but I I um I've always wanted to ask you about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, look, I'm very proud of it. I don't make a big deal about it because I never went to combat. Yeah. You know, I think the ones who should really get the, the tanks and everything are the ones who actually, you know, got of shot course. at. Sure. You know, like I was just in training. But uh, I joined when I was uh, a year in college. I was bored out of my mind. I was around people who were just getting drunk and you show up to exams. You just you'd never go to, I went to state school for the first, for that year. And you just study the night before and you're doing fine, right? It was like multiple choice exams. And, and I was bored out of my mind. I was like, I need something better than this. And, you know, I'm an immigrant child. So I always felt like a strong responsibility to the United States that sure. I want to serve this country. So I just went to a different recruiter's office and the, the army recruiter had this awesome photo of like these infantry guys running around shooting things. They showed me a video. I'm like, that sounds awesome. So I signed up. <laughs> <laughs> And turned 19 in boot camp, in boot camp at Fort Benning, Georgia. Wow. I, yeah. 
having known your brother a little bit, uh, uh-huh. I, I sometimes think of the two of you. Have you have you heard that expression? Uh, it's like uh, it's, they talked to, to two brothers and uh, the, their father was an alcoholic and, and one of them doesn't drink and the other is a drunk. And they go, well, you know, why? And their their answer for both of them oh. is because my dad was a drunk, right? One goes one way, one goes the other way. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, I, yeah. I've always been fascinated. You and your brother are so different, right? You're you're very uh-huh. similar, but you're so different. I've always wondered where, like, what what path you diverged from. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Um, I think we not to imply that your father was an alcoholic. No, that's a great. <laughs> yeah. I mean. That- I mean, look, especially as a father, I'm sure yeah. that's an interesting, for you, that's an interesting question. I think um, we both see challenges in our own way, and we mm-hmm. both have a strong sense of justice in our own yeah. way, that we want to see justice in the world. Uh, and that comes from our childhood, both of those. But where we made those different choices, but I'll tell you one thing, the, the experience of just being boot camp when I was 18 was such a formative experience that I think it that affected the rest of my life and I the bet. way and the things things I went off and did and challenges I took. That was a real like a marking point, a sure. defining point that made me go up in many, many different paths than than him. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are kind of like a yin and yang of each other, I feel like. <laughs> like you're you're <laughs> connected, that. you're the same shape, but then there is something very different and opposite about you two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and, and and yet you both seek out, you both work in the same part of the world, know a lot of the same, like, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting uh, series of contrasts and then also connections. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is. And I'm, I'm very, I mean, look, it was, you know, tech, very tech and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. It's a wonderful industry to be a part of, you know, it's, it's the internet's not a fad. It's not going yeah. away. If you're in tech, you're going to be just fine. Yeah. 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 So when, when you look at your, when you look at the path that you went on, did you feel like it was a reaction against something? Was there something you didn't want to be like? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I had a rough childhood, you know, like there's some things that my brothers, my brother never experienced that I did. Mm. Uh, I was older than him. And, um, and I wrote about him and love yourself because I wanted people to understand that they're not alone. Yeah. Um, that others go through this as well. Like I was molested as a kid and stuff like that. I'm sorry. And oh, thanks, man. But I mean, I I worked through it. it yeah. I went through therapy and all that. You know, I worked through it. And but I'm looking back, I see how that affected me and the choices I made. And one of them was I'm going to be tough. Mm. No one's going to mess with me again. That I remember clearly. Yeah. So that was part of the choice of joining the military. I'm going to be tough. I'm going to make mm. myself tough. Sure. You know, I still do things like that, make yeah. myself tough. You know, I do. And it's like, there's a, I guess it comes from like, no one's ever going to mess with me. Like that, it was very clear. Like I was a child. I didn't have a, I wasn't strong enough. Now I'm going to be a man and I'm going to be very strong. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So that's huge, actually. And I met a lot of, a lot of things I've done in my life. And I imagine that sort of toughness or that shell that you develop, that, that sort of stoicism in the lowercase sense probably made then the the irony is life doesn't throw you into a war zone or you know uh subject you to you know tough physical challenges in that sense it first subjects you to a bunch of mental health challenges for Mm. which you uh can't really toughen yourself up for and in fact toughness is the opposite remedy required yeah yeah, what saved me, you know, and I, you know, I look at my life as before I learned to, you know, love myself and act yeah. over myself. And what saved me was inner work and very soft, very sure, the ultimate, and so you know, which yes. is love, right? There's nothing tough in the sense there is a toughness in love, but you're talking about it. it's, sure. it's the opposite of what you think of as being a tough man. Yes, right, yeah, and that's what saved me, and that's right. what saved me again, and that's what saved me again. It's it's the it's just, it's the inner work. It's the inner. What's the right word? It's not vulnerability, um, but it's the I think that's the right word. No, no. It's like it's like uh, you reach this moment where um, your muscles are of no help. Like, yeah. right? Like you know, you need yeah. you need the opposite of muscle. You need you need to go inwards. There's there's not. It's not an external physical adversary in terms of another person or 
uh, you know, the elements or some physical challenge. It's, you know, how do I find a way to admit that I'm struggling? How do I find a way to like things about myself? How do I find, you know, a, a way to, to, to open up and explore these things? It's, it's the opposite of what joining the infantry is about. Yeah. And it's really interesting because I've come to believe over time, uh, and actually I'm to really know over time that it's the inner game. It is the inner game is the ultimate game. Sure. If your inner game's off, everything's off because your inner game will get you to the good and the bad. And the inner game will make the bad bearable. It will get you through it. But if your inner game is off and then the bad, that's when it's really bad. Sure. You know, that's when it's really bad. You know, and so much of our suffering, you know, the cliche happens without any external input. It just happens in the mind anyway. Right. right. The Mark Twain, and the Mark Twain, I've had so many problems and very few yeah. of them actually ever happened. And I think it goes back forever. Well, yeah, there's the the Milton quote that I was just talking uh, to someone about yesterday. Uh, the mind can make a, a heaven of hell and a mm. hell of heaven, right? Like yeah. uh, it yeah. doesn't matter. And I think this is part of what you talk about in the books, but <clears throat> it doesn't matter how successful or unsuccessful you are, how great things are going or how terrible they're going. If there's something wrong in here, if there's some misalignment in here, it will be awful. Meanwhile, if there is an alignment here, you can figure out a, a way through that uh, because okay. it's just a temporary external thing. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, and this makes sense, and this is how it works. The the more the inner game is better, the faster you can get through the bad times, you know, or at, at least the bad times seem like you're getting through them faster. And in the end, that's. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, we both know people who are rich and miserable. It's like, why? I would say you know, most so of them. Real, yeah, more you know, often than not. Yes. It's not a matter of having extra resources. But it's the inner game. And it is the most important game there is. Well, yeah, I think what, what happens is the misery or the unpleasantness or, or whatever, It instead of dealing with it, it manifests itself. Like you go, well, I'm going to focus on this thing over here, right? I'm going to really learn how to play the guitar or i'm going to really throw myself into building this company right or i'm going to do x y or z and that energy that misplaced energy is so forceful like uh there, there's a steven pressfield has this joke about how no one's ever seen hitler's art that basically it was <laughs> it was it was easier for hitler to take over germany and, and try to conquer the world than, than to be an oh artist God, right that's hysterical um that's so funny and the, although actually it's the, the joke is funny it's not actually true because you can see hitler's art the u.s government owns almost all of it it's in this vault uh they seized it after the war they didn't want there to be a market for hitler's art afterwards yeah, but yeah, but yeah. but the idea is that like you know dealing like dealing with your shit is really hard mm -hmm. getting good at stuff is hard but it's easier than dealing with your shit so what happens is people get really good at something they make a lot of money they spend a lot of time on it always hoping to never have to deal with the shit but that that can't go on forever eventually you right. come to a moment where it's inescapable that the shit is there your wife is telling you you have to deal with it you know some public scandal is telling you you have to deal with it you know some haunting misery is telling you, you have to deal with it your kids are making you, wh whatever it is there's something that forces you to reckon with it and then you you are forced to stare at this enormous thing you've built uh, essentially as an escape from the thing you've been putting off doing and dealing with and usually by then it's become pretty big yes <laughs> yes both it's of like them have become it. quite big yes yeah yeah um yeah, I mean, it, it is, uh, I, you know, I use the word mind. I think, yeah. you know, like I sometimes separate myself from the mind because I can watch my mind. Sure. And it's really like, I think the most important thing I've learned for myself I can do is always work on my mind, always be better at my mind. And, you know, like, and I'm going to go back to Seneca. I think he said like, you know, you know, you're really living philosophy when you're, when you become a friend to yourself. Yes. What yes. is a friend to yourself? Yeah. That's in your mind, mm -hmm. you know? What is a true friend to yourself? That's like, you know, when I do the love yourself stuff, you know, that's truly like, if I love myself, what would I do? Who would I be? How would I treat myself? Right? Sure. It's it's in the mind. The whole show like is in the mind. I, I love that quote. I actually have a chapter about it in the, in the, in the new book, Disciplines Destiny, because 
I think people think that discipline is all about pushing yourself further and further and further, further, harder and harder and harder. But there's an ill discipline in that. Like if all you do is go, Ryan, that's not yeah, good yeah, enough. Yeah, Ryan, yeah. that's not good yeah. enough. Ryan, that's not good enough. That's a form of excess. And and that is not no one no one actually gets to peak performance, to happiness, con- to contentment, et cetera, by telling themselves over and over again that they're a worthless piece of shit. Yeah, that doesn't pay off in the end. No. There's, <laughs> not that I know of anyway. There's a story about Cleanthes, one of the early Stoic philosophers, and and he he sort of is walking through Athens and he sees this man. The man's kind of like, you know, like being very hard on himself. You know, he's kind of taught uh-huh. you, you you've seen you've seen it a million times. He's not he's just you could tell someone's in being very hard on themselves. And uh, uh, he's sort of talking out loud and Cleanthes goes to him and he says, hey, I just want to tell you, um, you're not talking to a bad person, meaning that he himself wow. was not a bad. And you think about what an incredible gift that reminder can be and how I think we can catch ourselves when we start to spiral or pile on. You know, it's like you're not a shitty person. So why are you talking to yourself like a shitty person? You would never talk to one of your friends the way that you talk to yourself, nor would you allow anyone to talk to one of your friends the way that you're talking to yourself. It's funny, right? Like throughout human history, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's always the mind. You're just dealing with the mind. It's feeling, yeah, the scenery's changed. Yeah. Still, but the dialogue is pretty similar, right? It's, it's almost comical. You know, years ago, um, I think it was right after college. I saw my. I went to see Maya Angelou speak, do a mm. poetry reading, which yeah. is incredible. I mean, I I, it was a power. She was a powerhouse, and she she mentioned something before she started uh, reading her poems. She said, thousands of years ago, a Roman poet wrote, "I'm a human being, therefore nothing human is foreign to me." Yes, and I really remember. That's what actually like one of the things I remember. I think that's Terence. Is, is it really? Yeah, he's a slave. Yeah. That's awesome, because that really made me go the direction in my writing was, you know, when, you know how we talk about the vulnerability versus the tough thing? Yeah. Like I studied obsessively to write literary fiction. Like yeah. Hemingway was like my, my idol, like literary sure. fiction. That's where I trained myself. And then I write, end up writing a book. And, you know, I, all I did was collect rejection letters from publishers. Yeah, sure. Right. And then I ended up writing this little book about loving yourself. And bam, it puts me on the map as a writer. Yeah. It's kind of funny, right? <laughs> It's totally. like the soft stuff is the vulnerability, yeah. the inner game, not the beautiful craft of telling novel, you know, stories. But also we think it's like, you know, Hemingway is this bold, brave, courageous writer. That's what I want to emulate, this sort of masculine thing. And then it turns out that the thing that maybe we thought was soft or feminine is actually the scarier thing to do yes. and therefore yes. actually the truer yes. path, right? What does Hemingway say is, I actually have it right here. It says, all you have to do is write one true sentence, write the truest sentence that you know. You know, it's not a true sentence to emulate Hemingway doing all the fun, sexy, you know, glamorous stuff. It's, it's uh-huh. can you go deep and write the thing you're afraid to write? Yeah, yeah, that's true writing. That yeah. is true writing, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was I was thinking about is I think about it all the time, uh, and Tim has talked about this. But you you gave Tim Ferriss advice. You were a good friend at a, a pivotal moment in Ferriss's life, which is, you know, he was thinking about do I do this? Do I do that? You know, do I keep? He's obviously made a fortune as a tech investor, and you were basically like, you are very replaceable as a tech investor. If you stop <laughs> doing this, no one will care. The world will not look any different. You should do the thing that basically only you can do, which is, you know, writing is podcasts, et cetera. I, I, I love that advice. And I do think that is also what loving yourself is. It's like, don't do the thing that's comfortable, that's rewarding, that everyone else will uh, look at without question. Do the thing that's a little bit scarier, that is uniquely you. Uh, yeah. Do the thing that only you can do. Yeah. And when you get success, it gives you the greatest uh, inner reward. It's the greatest yeah. inner feeling. You know, yeah. you can have success in multiple areas in life. I mean, sure. I've had that. But the greatest inner reward comes from the thing that was purely yours. Yeah. It was purely yours. Yeah. That you just kept at it, that you gave to the world. 
I really talked about. Is. I think everyone should experience that feeling if they can. You know, I I was talking to David Rubenstein about this, the the billionaire, and he, I was saying that one of the things I noticed is that all the billionaires I've met, they all want to write books. Uh, <laughs> and, me, me, meanwhile, every author that I know wants to be really rich or richer than they are, right? And and so there's some irony in that, but it's like, wait, if I have the thing that people with lots of money are trying to use their money to get, right? Uh, you should maybe just stick with what you have, right? It's like, what do people want to use their money for? It's freedom, it's to feel fulfilled, mm -hmm. et cetera. Well, the, the irony is that money is not always the best way to get that thing. You can have that thing more easily than you often think you can. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, what it requires having to really sit down, be honest with ourselves, which yes. I don't think we often do like the yeah. level of honesty. I think in some ways being in the hospital last year gave me that. Um, I, I've thought a lot about honesty with oneself and I was like, Oh my God, I thought I've been honest with myself before, but like when you're in the bottom is like, you know, that's when you're just like, you have nothing to lose. Right. So might as well just be so honest with yourself that, uh, before you would horrify yourself at even just sure. a thought. And man, I wish uh, we can give ourselves that. And the thing we can is to just truly be honest with ourselves. We are, we realize, oh, well, this is what I really want, not what I thought I wanted. This is what I, you know? Yeah. Well, have you, so so thinking of, of, of the advice that you gave Tim, where you're like, you know, life is short. Mm -hmm. How are you going to spend that time? As you came out of it, you know, the Stokes talk about like, okay, Imagine your life is over, you've died, and then magically yeah. you, come, you come back to life. What, how are you gonna? How would you change? But that happens to you. So that kind of happened what, to me. Yeah. yeah what? What? <laughs> as, after the recovery passed, yeah. what kind yeah. of changes did you end up making as a result of the experience? Dude, that's a great question, and, I, and I'll tell you, it's because my mind, I like that's why I'm big on the mind because I've worked on my mind, and you know. I literally ate my own dog food, like yeah. my, you know, I gave yeah, like sure. my life depending on it. Jeez, the title, you know, it just keeps, <laughs> um, I, when I came out and I, I've been just like, okay, I'm, I'm living in a way I've never lived before. Uh, I, tr first of all, I'm truly grateful for every, every day, every, everything, but I'm only doing what I want to do, when I want to do on my terms. I don't care what anyone desires of me. If I want to do it, I do it. No, the, the no is so simple. I yeah. will cut off relationships in a heartbeat with friends. If they're an ass to me once, I don't yeah. care. I'm too good. I sure. don't have time for this. Yeah. Right? It's, I, and I'm loving this. Like, and that allows me to give time to the ones that matter. And even things like, I, I'll tell you something funny. I woke up in November. I don't know where this came from. I thought, I want to be like John Wick. So I got went to my network, Tim Larkin, a dear friend of ours, yeah. you know, great guy. He put me in touch with the former SEAL Team 6 operator, Steve Sanders. Incredibly, like the guy's a legend, very well decorated, very highly decorated, has done all the stuff you would imagine yeah. SEAL Team 6 to do, right? And I called the guy and I told him that, and I could hear on the other end thinking, what a jackass. Yeah. You know, like he's thinking, but yeah. he, he's like, okay, come, come on, let's, let, let's see, you know, let's see what, how you can train. So I showed up and I, and I, and I just showed a beginner's mind, completely yeah. humble. And I showed up and I showed up, started training and like, I trained with him basically full time for four months. Okay. Every day I would show up. And he told me later on, he's like, there were days I did not think you were going to show up the next day. <laughs> I just wore your mind out that yeah. I just saw you fall apart. And then I showed up the next day. And what happened was I got really good. Yeah. And in the process, it was like very much like the, um, you know, the bo uh, one book that really affected me was uh, Book of Five Rings by yeah. my, my sure. Masashi. Right? It was very much just like you, you, you know, you, you do for yourself. You, um, and I just kept, and I became really good at combat shooting. Now, is this a skill I plan on ever using? No. You know, I hope I never have to use it. But what's interesting is you follow these little inklings in your head. And, you know, I have, fortunately, I have the connection and resources to do it, but it's whatever it is. It's kind of helped me also come to life, like learning something new and challenging yourself, being challenged in something new in a beginner's mind sort of way and something that was intense. I was coming back to life and it really helped me come back to life and gave me also a different kind of confidence than I never had before. Huh. And I wasn't even expecting, like, I don't walk sure. around with a gun or anything like that, but it just gave me 
it gave me a very interesting confidence. And I've always been a confident guy. Yeah. But like gave me a, like a, a whole level of confidence never had. And so I re- decided that like, I'm going to do more of these things. I'm just going to like, I'm going to pick something that interests me and, and just find whatever I can work on it to be the best I can at it. And it challenges me. And because you just get better and better through the process in ways you never expected. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I didn't expect to fall in love with it. And, and like, I really feel, and I really feel this way. I'm learning from a modern day samurai who's come sure. back from the wars, hung up his sword and took out a student who's yeah. finally like doesn't just listens yeah. and, and is teaching him the way. It's wow. incredible. Has it made it easier? And obviously this is a first world thing, but has it made yeah. it easier for you to say no to money, like to things that could be potentially oh, say lucrative? No to anything. Um, say no to anything. I only do things uh, for certain values, right? And I don't give, excuse me, but I don't give a fuck. Yeah, like I literally, it's like you can't you can't dissuade me if I want to do it, and if I don't want to do it, you can't convince me. Right. Like it's actually it's a great feeling. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great feeling. <laughs> well, it's funny because people think like, oh, once I reach a certain level, once I have a certain amount, then I'll I'll get that right. Then I'll be at a place where I only do things that I want to do, and I don't do things that I don't want to do. When really it has nothing to do with what you have or don't have, and it has everything to do with some place that you can get to inside where you don't feel a need, where you have a certain kind of inner security that makes you go, yeah, I, I, I'm not starving, so why do I have to say yes to this thing, even though it's lucrative or even though other people are doing it, even though it's crazy to say no to it? It's really hard to do. Yeah, because in the end, I'm part of part of myself. Yeah. Sure. You know, and, and that allows me to actually focus on things that I think what I want, what I want is over long term will yeah. pay off bigger, you sure. know, like the more, because it's easy to say that yes, to the short term, quick money hits, yeah. but that takes you away from the big long term thing, you know, like what, what the real thing is yeah. and careers and anything is a long term game. It's not yeah. a short term game. A lot of people forget that, especially in business where they're unethical. I realize this is a long term game. Your, your, your name. You know, and especially in small industries like tech or whatever, your name will, you know, people check on you yeah. years down the road and that will affect you for the rest of your life rather than the short grab you did. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you something very interesting. Um, I've been wanting to share this with you yeah. on the podcast and it comes from obviously someone who's a billionaire, but notice there's no money involved in this. And yeah. this I realized watching him, how he lives the perfect day and how I've started, I've, I've started applying it to shoulders to friends. They're all applying it. And... <clears throat> And it has, and, but if you break it down, it has nothing to do with this money. Because when I first started telling people, like, oh, yeah, he's a billionaire, of course. Sure. I'm like, okay, but you can do this too, okay? Yeah. So I, I got to hang out, uh, and it's not a big deal because a yeah. lot of people do. I hang out with Richard Branson for a week earlier this year, okay, at, at his island. And it was one day that he goes uh, cycling on a neighboring, neighboring island. So I was with a bunch of people, like 30s guys, very fit. They're like yeah. fitness, literally fitness influencers on Instagram, whatever. They're like, oh, we're going to go with Richard Branson. We're going to go biking with him. We'll connect with him. We're going to hang out with him. I was supposed to go. And the call was at 5 a.m. I woke up and like, screw this. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't go. They went. And I went to breakfast that day, and I've never seen a bunch of grown men cry and moan so much. And these are very fit guys. Yeah. He smoked them. Okay. He smoked them. And they're like, oh, my God, it was just uphill for 17 miles. We got top of a hill, another hill, another hill. Right? So then... And so then the guy, I think Richard Branson is like 71 or yeah. 70 or 71, right? And he comes back. And, and so I meet him for breakfast. You know, we hang a breakfast and he goes off. He's like, I'm going to work. And I meet him in, uh, later for, I ran him later in lunch. And I just asked him, what was he doing? He said, well, I was working. Obviously, the guys on boards or companies or whatever yeah. is working. And then he was, he was really bothered by the Ukraine war. Really, yeah. barely bothered. It was still new. Yeah. And he was actually talking to European leaders about what they can do to maybe like, move oils from countries that don't need it and gas sure. to ones that need it to kind of like take away the balance of power from Russia. Yeah. Right. And then, um, and then after that, I saw him, he was out kite surfing. He was just playing in the water, kite surfing, having a great day. And they went off at dinner with his wife and uh, with his wife, with his wife and grandkids. Right. So I was like, okay, this guy, what are you doing? How did he live his day? I mean, yeah. cause I realized, Holy cow, this guy's a full day. Yeah, Imagine yeah. living a life with these full days. He woke up, 
he did something very physical that involves extreme physical fitness for himself, like sure. physical fitness that over time, because he'd done it consistently over time, he's smoking dudes a third, two thirds his age yeah. and very fit dudes. Sure. You only get that from consistency over time, right? Sure. First thing in the morning. Then he had, obviously has a good breakfast or whatever. Then he goes and works. He yeah. puts his hours in, right? Whatever the job is. And then he sits down and spends a little bit of time on something that bothers him in the world. Mm. It could be in your community. It could be on your block. It could be in the world. Making but he a positive does something difference. About, he does something about it. He doesn't yeah. get on Twitter and bitch yeah. and moan about it. Sure. He doesn't get into arguments. There was none of that. No lecturing to anyone, any of us. Sure. It's purely because someone asked him what he thought, sure. right? Does something about it. And then he plays. He makes yeah. time to play. Sure. And then gets enough quality time with his family. Yeah. And I'm like, that's a full day. That's a great life. And then right if there. you add that over time, that's a full life. Yeah, sure. He's got to go to his grave, like having lived a full life. Yes. And I really took that away. I'm like, I've been applying that. You know? Yeah. The Stoics talk about how also what Memento Mori does is you don't think about like, how do I want my life to be? You think, how do I want my day to be because this day is itself a complete life, right? So he's not saying on Tuesdays I work out and Thursdays I see my family, on Fridays I do this. He's saying, how do I do, how do I have a, a good enough selection of all the things that provide meaning and challenge yeah. and connection and happiness and fun? And how do I set up a day to do it? So if today is the end, then I had a great day and a great life. If I get to do it again tomorrow, that's awesome, right? So I think too many people think about like where they want to end up in life and they don't think, how do I want to design my life day to day so that's the win, right? People work yeah. for years to sell a company to then have freedom when really they'd probably be better off. The safer bet would be how do you design a work-life balance that doesn't require a billion dollars at the end to do the stuff that you want. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like, it's funny because I, I've met, you know, I've, I, you know, I both know enough success, highly successful people. Some of them along the way, figure it out. Yeah. And honestly, they're, they're by that time, they're matured enough that what their projects are doing even better. Yeah. We have this myth of like the 90 year old hoodie, I mean, look, it takes a certain level of obsession to create anything great. Mm. To be a writer, you have to be a crazy obsessed person, right? Sure. You have to put in the hours. But over time, you realize the balance. I mean, that's what lets you create a body of work yeah. rather than that, that one off. Sure. You can't create the body of work. I mean, some writers did, but like, look at their lives. None of us would want their lives. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned the family thing. You're like one of the nicest people I've met. You're the, you're the one that surprises me the most. Not, not that you have to do these things or don't have to do these things, but you're the one that surprises me the most that isn't married and has kids. Yeah, oh, that's how it kind of worked out, you know? And I'll tell you one thing. Um, this is actually when decision I made in the hospital bed. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'm, okay, this is, I'm just yeah. very honest. I'm in the hospital bed. It's my birthday. Yeah. Okay. I'm hooked up to, they, they injected me with fentanyl. When they inject you with fentanyl in the hospital, it's no joke. These yeah, things, yeah. you know, give them yeah. a little, okay. All, and it was really bad, right? And that's my hospital. And the, the day birthday in the hospital bed, uh, my brother and a friend came to visit me. Then they left, and I'm just there by myself. And I was like, "Dude, you have this long and illustrious life of falling in love, you know, falling deeply in love, it being wonderful, great, and then not working out, and then just being miserable, and then getting up, and then doing it again. Where'd that get you?" And the answer was in a hospital, hospital room alone on your birthday by yourself. Sure. And you know what I did? All right. You know what the definition of insanity is, right? Keep trying <laughs> Try to it again. And again, yeah. and it, right? So I was like, I dropped the desire. I literally dropped the desire. And with it, I'm not saying I'm not going to have it. Because yeah. I'm very capable of having it. But I'll tell you, freedom and happiness, like inner happiness and lightness is from dropping desires. Sure. I dropped that desire and it's like the world's opened up to me in that arena if I want. Sure. So I'm actually just playing. I like, look, I just got my life back a year ago. I'm like a kid. Yeah. I'm literally like a kid who's running around. It's desire to be here wrapped, unwrapping Christmas presents every day. Like when you lose your health that badly, 
when you get it and you have, you know, you like life, you have like, and I've built resources so I can do whatever I want. You know, I work hard, but I do whatever I want. Like, you were literally like, it's, it's Christmas. You know, you want to sure. live your life like it's Christmas. So if that comes, great. But if not, I have wonderful nephews that I adore, you know, that's sure. just like, and you know, women are, the, there's plenty of wonderful women in this planet that. <laughs> well, no, it's like, um, it's like, I, I use this analogy sometimes, but it's like, it's like golf. The harder you try at golf, the worse you are at golf. Mm. Right. And, and yeah. I think to go to your point about samurai or shooting or archery, it's, it's sometimes it's your intense desire to do it a certain way that actually disrupts the flow or the rhythm or the naturalness of it. And so the letting go of the willful will, as the Buddhists call it, might actually open you up to do the thing that you are supposedly relinquishing. Yeah, I'm not looking for it. Yeah, I'm not. And, you know, it's like, what is it like suffering comes from, like, not having what you desire. So if you drop yeah. the desire, you're just open. Sure. It's not suffering. You and, can still you know, get it. Good. Yeah. 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 Sure. But no, it's, it's also with a and walking this earth with an open feeling like you're open rather than you're seeking is is a far internally is is. Oh, my God, it's the best. Yeah, well, I I also imagine that the need or the desperation is the wrong word, but the 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 wanting this, the expectation of a thing, it must it probably does cloud the energy and the decisions and the thinking about each thing. It makes it harder to just be fully present in whatever moment that you're in. Yeah, and be open to whoever may come. Sure, right? Like it's the same in business, the same in everything. Like. It's it's hard to do, um, but yeah, you know, they they had it right thousands of years ago. We just have to basically just read what they said and apply it, like, versus that learn it the hard way ourselves and sure. us write books about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I'm so yeah. I'm so I'm so glad that you've come out of the other side of it, and and I do hope another Thank book you. comes. I, I do hope another book comes from it because uh, that is that is the unique skill that you have sort of relaying those experiences that taking the specific and making it universal. And I hope, I do hope you do it again. Thank you. You know what? I will strongly consider <laughs> it means a lot, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, uh, you're the best. You are, man. It's been a pleasure. And look, I said this before you started recording, but look, it's, I didn't say this part. I've known you for about, about a decade now. Yeah. This is like before, uh, any of the Stoic or Daily Stoic came out, whatever, um, before your obstacle, you know, what was the first one? You Was it the obstacle? Obstacle, yeah. Right? And so after, and trust me, I'm lying, which is actually how I, I didn't know you then, but I actually, like, when you did the pre, uh, pre-order, yeah. I got the large bundle so yes. I could have a call with you, which we never did. <laughs> this is our call. This, this is, is the call. call cause, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, this guy is sharp. I want to meet him, right? And we ended up meeting and becoming friends yeah. and then watching. You know, like how you just kept at it, kept at it, Thank kept you. at it, and the body of work you built, and how you're living your life, actually expressing those values, man. It's it's incredible. I am Thank so you. like honored to be your friend. Uh, likewise, man. Likewise. Thank you.